160 Tower, home of the Pennsylvania Northeast Regional Railroad Authority here in Scranton, Pennsylvania, for part 14 of the Lackawanna Cutoff. Farewell to the cutoff. Hi, I'm Chuck Walsh, and I'm president of the North Jersey Rail Commuter Association, and we're about to embark upon a four-part series on the period of time from the time that the Lackawanna Cutoff is put out of service in 1979 all the way through the present time and into the future. And we're going to have a discussion with the president of the Pennsylvania Northeast Regional Railroad Authority, Larry Mowski, and we'll talk about a myriad of subjects, um, not only about what's happening with the cutoff, but also about the activities here in Pennsylvania, which will be very interesting and very relevant actually for New Jersey because there's now an interrelationship between Pennsylvania and New Jersey as far as rail service in the future, certainly, but there always has been, but um, with the removal of the cutoff, that's, that interrelationship now has become even more important because it's clear that Pennsylvania is going to play a key role in helping reactivate the, the cutoff. Now, just a little bit of a orientation here. This is the main line. This is the, uh, the area in which the, the end of service, if you will, the far end of service when the full build out of the extension of service over the cutoff into Pennsylvania will come into here in Scranton. I'm actually going to do a 180 here and I'm going to step across the tracks because uh, and we're just going to reorient you because where we are, the tower here uh, was placed its name for the bridge, Bridge 60, but behind me here, you can see the, the station for Steamtown, and then Steamtown National Historic Site is all in this area right here, and the Delaware Lackawanna, which is the operator of rail service from here to Slateford Junction, uh, operates through here. Earlier there were some uh, locomotives work, walking, working through here. Um, it's quiet at this point in time. You see trolley museum um, as well. So in any case, in this particular episode we're going to talk about, I want to say the farewell to the cutoff. We know that, and this is the period of time between 1979 and 1984, from the time that the last freight train operates over the cutoff until the time that the tracks were removed on the cutoff. Uh, we know how that ends. We know that the tracks are removed. We call it farewell, but it really isn't farewell because farewell would imply that, this, that the cutoff is never coming back, and that's not true. And over the next four episodes, we're going to talk about, we'll say the dark times, certainly from the the early times where there's the effort, and we'll talk about that in, in, in this episode where we there's the effort to try to save the cutoff, but in subsequent episodes where we talk about the saving of the cutoff, uh, the rebuilding of the cutoff, and then finally in the fourth episode of this quadrilogy, if you will, we'll talk about the future of the cutoff. So hopefully you'll see all these episodes, they're coming, and we'll go through them, and um, it'll be a very interesting treatment of this particular subject because uh, this is not one, uh, we, we've been talking about history for the most part in the past. Now we're going to talk about not only the history up to the present, but also the future. So now we move on to our interview with Larry Malski. Here we are inside the Bridge 60 Tower, which is 
the home of the Pennsylvania Northeast Railroad Authority. And we're here to speak to the president of the Pennsylvania Northeast Railroad Authority, Larry Malski. And Larry, I'd like to certainly thank you for your time um, to allow us to interview you and, and talk about uh, some history and also looking into the future, which is, I think, a very interesting thing that um, many of our viewers would be interested in. But before we even start with talking about the, the history of the effort to save the cutoff and the line in Pennsylvania, uh, I'd like to talk a little bit about yourself because uh, you have been involved with this effort for a very long time, and maybe you can just give us a start from wherever you wish to begin and tell us about your background and how you came to be in this office, I guess I would say. Well, first of all, I'd like to uh, welcome you and thank you, uh, Chuck, and commend you for, uh, again, the work you're doing on this. Uh, Luck want to cut off and uh, the entire project between Scranton and New York City is uh, um, something that's been around for uh, quite a while, uh, actually since uh, the termination service, and I think it's uh, excellent that you're putting together this series of uh, uh, you know, historic and, and factual uh, background on uh, what has happened and maybe much more importantly, what, uh, what is going to happen in the future. So uh, I want to just say that up front and commend you on that. Um, just a little background. Um, I'm kind of a native to uh, the Scranton area of Lackawanna County. I was born and raised in Dixon City, which is the first city just north of Scranton uh, on the old D&H main line. Um, I uh, basically uh, I went to uh, Penn State undergrad. I graduated from uh, law school at Temple University in Philadelphia. Uh, and I went on to uh, enter the field uh, that I hoped to, to enter, which was the railroad industry. Um, while I was in college, I was very fortunate uh, to have the opportunity to work for uh, the Delaware and Hudson as my first employer. Uh, that was back in uh, 19, June of 1970 is when I hired out as a clerk, a yard clerk, right here in Scranton. Uh, so again, my, my roots do go pretty deep here. I also worked for the Erie Lackawanna. Um, uh, during my college years. Uh, as um, you, you probably know, that was during the Derrico years where the area Lackawanna and the Delaware Hustle were under common management under Derrico, uh, owned by uh, Norfolk and Western. So um, those were my college years, but I always hearken back to that time as maybe some of the uh, most joyful and uh, um, interesting times of my career because I got a really good start in the industry from the grassroots level, uh, working as a yard clerk, uh, um, computer clerk, and a rate clerk, actually, for those roads. Um, after graduating law school, I did go to work uh, in Washington, D.C. with the United States Railway Association. I was in the litigation department. Uh, as you might recall, there was all kinds of litigation that stemmed from uh, uh, the Conrail uh, structure. Um, after USRA, uh, four years down there, I was very fortunate to get a job with Walter Rich as his general counsel in Cooperstown, New York, working for the New York, Susquehanna, and Western, uh, where I was for about four years. And uh, it was four years, but it was, uh, I got about 10 years of experience up there, uh, because Walter was quite an individual to work for, and uh, uh, many, uh, many times we'd, we'd be working seven days a week at, on a regular basis. But it was very fascinating, because it was during the time that we acquired the uh, Syracuse and Utica divisions from Conrail. We negotiated the trackage rights of the Delaware uh, between Port Jervis uh, and northern New Jersey and Binghamton. Um, and we actually uh, bought the Susquehanna from the bankruptcy trustee. So it was a very interesting uh, period of growth on the, uh, on the New York Susquehanna Western uh, and the uh, Delaware at Seagull system. After that, uh, by a fluke, <clears throat> I actually had an opportunity to come back to my hometown, which is pretty unusual um, in that. Uh, it was uh, the early 80s, and uh, Guilford owned the Delaware and Hudson, and the uh, D&H uh, main between Scranton and Carbondale uh, was um, being downgraded severely to the point that uh, most of the line north of Scranton was actually taken out of service. Uh, and they did have plans to basically uh, liquidate it, take up the rail, etc. So I actually came down as a consultant to Lackawanna County, who was looking at trying to save the line for economic development purposes, uh, since there was no one else to purchase the line, uh, there were no private interests interested in purchasing the line, uh, and it certainly faced certain uh, liquidation. Uh, came down, uh, did my uh, consulting duties, made the recommendation to Lackawanna County, 
uh, that uh, there's always risk involved, but it's worth saving this line because once you lose the line, once it gets liquidated, abandoned, and ripped up, obviously, it's very difficult to bring back. And uh, came up with a recommendation to form the uh, Rail Authority, which we did, uh, and uh, kind of the rest is history. Um, you know, we started off uh, 34 years ago with that, uh, and uh, our first year of operation uh, through a private operator, which we uh, went to an RFP and, and hired uh, to run the system, actually. Uh, we had about 500 revenue cars. Um, and this past year, actually this year, 2017, we'll be having a record year, well over 8,000 uh, 8, cars. So it shows that, uh, you know, uh, when the local governments get involved to save these rail lines, um, it's a very good decision for the future. Um, and that's kind of where we are. Of course, part and parcel of what was going on in the early 80s was the downgrading of a lot of lines in Northeast Pennsylvania and New Jersey, the main one being the, uh, the, the formal DL and W Lackawanna, Erie Lackawanna main line. Um, after we were able to save the Carbondale line, a very similar scenario played out on the uh, Lackawanna main line through the Poconos. Conrail was in the uh, stages of uh, abandoning. They actually had formally abandoned a lot of it, and they were actually starting to liquidate it, pull spikes, getting ready to lift the rail. Uh, and again, we uh, basically were able to use the local rail authorities as a safety net, since no private interests wanted the line at that point, um, and Conrail really didn't want to sell it to any private interests, quite honestly. Uh, so the local government uh, safety net of the rail authority was there to save the line, to save the railroad through the Poconos. And voila, here we are today, 2017. So what was your first involvement directly with, um, uh, I'll either say either saving the line um, here in, in, in Pennsylvania, and to what degree were you, let's say, observing what was going on in New Jersey? Um, maybe you could say a little bit about that. Yeah, it was uh, very interesting in that, <clears throat> again, I was working uh, with Walter for Walter Bridge in Cooperstown, and obviously the uh, Susquehanna was based in New Jersey, uh, the original Susquehanna. So um, I, I was tuned in to what was happening, obviously. Um, state of New York, uh, with some foresight, put a lot of money into the uh, Delaware division between Binghamton and Port Jervis, so that uh, Conrail did uh, operate and save that line. Um, that was not the case with the Scranton Division, which of course ran through uh, Binghamton to Scranton, New Jersey. Um, so I, I had, you know, a pretty good insight as to what was going on. Um, but we really got involved uh, again when we formed the Rail Authority, um, and in the, at the same time, Monroe County through the Monroe County Rail Authority, which was uh, formed in 1982, um, was. Uh, up and running again as a grassroots um, uh, organization of last result because again there was no private interest um, involved in trying to save the rail line through Monroe County. The Monroe County Rail Authority took up the, uh, the lead in trying to preserve what was there in Monroe County. Um, from a, a very early point both rail authorities uh, worked very close together as the safety net to save the entire line and uh, it was in the uh, uh, probably the uh, early, uh, the, the mid-1980s that uh, we saw the handwriting on the wall, Conrail, Conrail told us what the handwriting on the wall was, and um, you know, action had to be, an action plan had to be put together to save the line uh, all the way to, uh, to the Delaware River. So when Conrail puts the line between Port Morris and actually Binghamton out of service. Uh, initially, it's the the DNH that steps in, um, and is that Guilford? I'm trying to think in those days. Guilford owned the DNH, yeah, uh, and picks up the section uh, west of Scranton Correct. to Binghamton. I, I want to say somewhere towards the end of 1980. I'm wondering what effect does that possibly have, in your opinion? on, let's say, Conrail's view of the rest of the line? Do they think, okay, this is one piece that DNH is now putting together, does now the section east of Scranton become like, could they be thinking about 
getting into that? I mean, is there you know anything to that in your estimation? Yeah, th th there was a connection, obviously. Um, <clears throat> uh, Conrail made the decision to get out of the entire line between uh, Binghamton, uh, Scranton, and northern New Jersey. So that was kind of cast in stone once that happened, and they sold the, uh, the Scranton to Binghamton uh, section of the old Lackawanna to the D&H. Uh, that was kind of another shoe that dropped. Um, at that point, um, from Conrail's perspective, Scranton to northern New Jersey through the Poconos was superfluous. Um, and in fact, um, again, the handwriting was on the wall in that uh, what few remaining shippers were left on the line, industries were left on the line, were encouraged, uh, let's leave it at that, by Conrail to move elsewhere or, or to leave. Uh, and there were some major uh, entities, such as the uh, Chrysler and Loading Facility at Mount Pocono. Um, that they were encouraged to leave. They did leave. Uh, they moved uh, their operation from Mount Pocono to northern New Jersey. Um, and whatever else was all, uh, still remaining on the line was pretty much uh, uh, shut down. And that's when Conrail went into the abandonment mode. And again, a large portions of the uh, main line between Scranton and uh, the water cap were illegally abandoned. So they were in the process of, uh, uh, you know, not only out of service, but Conrail was starting to the process of liquidating and pulling spikes and getting ready to remove the rail. So it was really at that point we uh, we had to we had to move, or it would be uh, ripped up, and uh, uh, that would be the end of it. Which. Brings me to my next question, and, and, and in a sense, asks you to put on your uh, attorney hat, and that is, what happens at abandonment that makes it so difficult—not impossible, but difficult—to bring a line back? That what what happens legally? I guess what I'm I'm asking, that is an impediment that wouldn't be there if the line were not abandoned formally. That's a very good question, uh, and, and it's one, and I don't want to bore everybody with all the technical legal details, but it's an extremely important question because it's uh, really shown in history what's happened to many lines that haven't been saved. Um, and it really relates to what happened to the cutoff, to be honest with you. Um, without getting into all the specific details, uh, a lot of bad things happen when the uh, line is uh, officially abandoned, number one, but even worse, when the rail gets lifted. And the reason for that is uh, there's a myriad of reasons, but one uh, right off the bat is, uh, from a legal perspective, once you take the rail up, uh, you really get into the legal technicalities of what type of title did the railroad have. Um, and what that means basically is, uh, if they didn't have fee simple title, which is the best title you could have, um, there are many areas, uh, and you have to read each deed, so it's not, it's not carte blanche, this applies to every line. You really have to get into the technicalities of each deed that the original railroad um, uh, used to acquire this land. But once you actually lift the rail, in many cases it triggers what's called reversionary interest which means that in some cases, if the language is in those particular deeds, um, you actually lose the title to the, to the property. So um, the, the mere fact of abandoning, which is a legal process through the ICC, Interstate Commerce Commission, is one step in the grave. The second step in the grave is lifting that rail. But by lifting that rail, you could uh, bring to uh, bear uh, the, the, the legal extremities of actually losing the land, too. Um, in other words, those deeds are actually conditioned on having the rail there. And once the rail is actually gone, i.e., you know, liquidated, lifted, uh, ripped up, um, the land actually could go away and revert either to uh, adjoining landowners or other parties. So uh, it's it's a pretty bad situation when uh, when that happens. So you were you were saying just before that the Conrail, uh, speaking in, in Pennsylvania, obviously we know what was going on in New Jersey, but in Pennsylvania. They they actually progressed to that point where abandonment they they didn't it wasn't formally abandoned but it was obviously they were what petitioning for abandonment no, or what as I said it's kind of a <laughs> it's a two step process into the grave number one is uh, abandonment and Conrail had filed formal abandonment uh, proceedings with the Interstate Commerce Commission and got uh, orders for abandonment so there were large portions of the Pocono Main Line that were legally abandoned. Um, so that was, the, again, one foot in the grave. The second foot, like I said, is ripping the rail up. They were poised to do that and actually started to do that by uh, pulling spikes and things of that nature when, um, uh, again, at least we had the structure in place, the rail authorities, uh, as the last resort to save, as a safety net, to save it. And through the rail authorities, we were able to bring uh, negotiations 
uh, with the likes of the governor of Pennsylvania, Governor Casey, um, Senator Specter uh, at the federal level, uh, former Governor uh, Scranton, uh, and, and, and some very important people in their, in their uh, organizations. Uh, one I just want to mention is Andy Wallace, who is uh, Senator Specter's chief aide and was very, very helpful uh, in the day-to-day -day struggle to um, uh, negotiate with Conrail uh, and change their decision to uh, lift the rail off the Pocono Main Line. So, um, obviously there was political support, political support within politicians, but presumably there was also local support, I don't know, say grassroots, or uh, even the press, I think, you know, there must have been uh, quite a bit of activity in the press that, um, that covered this whole, it was almost like a, certainly in the New Jersey, it was almost a six year period between 1979 and uh, um, 1984. Uh, actually, five years, but um, it, the visibility of the, the of the the peril, I guess you'd say, to the rail line uh, must have struck a, a chord, particularly here in Pennsylvania. It certainly did in New Jersey. I can speak that it did. Um, but I'm, I'm wondering, how did that help, or, or did it, or hinder? You know, because the presses we know can um, they can. Um, play out in, in many different ways, sometimes unpredictably, but how did that actually play into this? And then also think of the um, bizarre situation with the World War II tank that was brought out at some point. Um, that, that, that Those kind of things, um, and with uh, even the Amtrak run in 1979, that brought visibility, even if there, nothing came out of the Amtrak run directly, it definitely created a visibility that probably wouldn't have been there otherwise. And I'm wondering, you know, putting all that together, did that, in a sense, create a um, uh, basically uh, an interest that might not have uh, been triggered any other way? Well, it, it, it's a very good uh, question because it does go to the the, the heart of what you know the public uh, uh, involvement in this was. And you know you hear so much in this day and age about heritage and heritage preservation and everything else. Well, there was no other pres heritage preservation effort that was much that was more important than this rail line, the Lackawanna Main Line, because it touched so many families and people uh, in uh, in Pennsylvania, but especially in Northeast Pennsylvania. Uh, so many people, uh, parents, uh, you know, either worked or rode. Uh, so many people actually did ride the last trains, uh, passenger trains. Uh, uh, on the railroad, I, I I'll, uh, just a quick side story. I uh, remember I remember uh, uh, getting out of school and riding uh, um, the last uh, eastbound train on January fifth, nineteen seventy, with a good friend Jim Kilcullen um, between Scranton and Hoboken. Uh, and uh, again, it was a very sad day, uh, but I think from that day on, everyone felt that that's something that has to be restored at some point. But the point is, the press was very involved in this because it was so important to not only our, our heritage, uh, which touches a nerve uh, to everyone in Northeast Pennsylvania, um, but also the future economic development of Northeast Pennsylvania uh, was going to be gone and stripped of this transportation asset, uh, which which had brought all the jobs, which hauled all the coal, which provided all the jobs uh, to Northeast Pennsylvania. Uh, and here it was after, you know, close to 150 years about to be um, dismembered uh, and, and, uh, and liquidated. So it, it, it was a rallying cry. Um, the public was very supportive. Um, you know, the decision had to be made, made and I just gave the advice that if you don't do it now, it'll, it'll be gone forever. Um, and it, it, was it a risk? Sure it was a risk. Anything you do is a risk. But if you didn't take the risk, uh, you'd be foregoing the economic future of Northeast Pennsylvania. And uh, again, as I just mentioned, the carloads, uh, which is the main indicia of uh, success in, in the railroad industry, kind of prove out, uh, thank God, that uh, everyone collectively was able to make that decision back, uh, back uh, well over 30 years ago. Now, now, as we sit here in, in Scranton, which would be the end of the line if the full build out, whenever that takes place, um, for the extension of the, the cutoff across into uh, the Commonwealth of, of Pennsylvania. Uh, but I'm, I'm, I'm also um, uh, drawing back on what you were saying just now, how the, the line had played such an important role in the 
economic vitality of the whole region of northeastern Pennsylvania. I'm wondering that it must have been quite a shock that there was a risk that the, the line would have been abandoned. That this, in a sense, had to change the paradigm of um, not only the people who live here, but the politicians who would have to be able to create some entity that could preserve it. That's, that's where the, the rail authorities come in, and they play that role. But that didn't happen immediately. It, it had to, I imagine it took a little bit of time before that, um, before that actually took place. But it's, um, it, it's actually a testament to the, um, the, the people of, of, of Pennsylvania that they were able to, to save this line, even though it, it, I didn't really realize that actually there had been formal abandonment. So the, you, you're kind of, in a sense, pulling, the, pulling the, uh, the railroad, in a sense, metaphorically, out of the fire. <laughs> it was, it was. <laughs> again, I, I refer to it, uh, and there's other steps too, but uh, just in a general sense, there's, there's two steps to the grave for a rail line. One is a formal abandonment by the owner. Uh, and the second is liquidation, i.e. lifting the rail, getting rid of the ties, and, uh, and just basically liquidating what's there. So uh, we had one foot in the grave. Uh, I can recall uh, probably the pivotal meeting uh, that was held in, uh, uh, in Conrail's boardroom in Philadelphia uh, with uh, President Jim Hagan of Conrail, uh, at which time Governor Casey, Senator Specter, um, uh, and there were many others involved. Governor Scranton was very much involved. Again, Andy Wallace, who worked for Senator Specter, was directly involved. And there's many others. Um, and, uh, and people like Bob Hay uh, from uh, the Monroe County Railroad Authority, uh, and Ed Rogers, who was one of uh, my uh, board members, um, got together. And uh, it was at the urgings of Governor Casey uh, that Jim Hagan uh, made the, uh, at this point, uh, uh, very meritorious decision on his part uh, to tell his troops to stop the liquidation process, i.e. lifting the spikes, taking the rail up through the Poconos, uh, and that they, they would do a deal with us, the rail authority, um, to uh, convey the line to us. Um, that was probably one of the most pivotal meetings uh, in saving the rail line in Pennsylvania. And uh, Jim Hagan followed through uh, with his word, and it took a, a series of years uh, to convey the line to us, but uh, um, the line was eventually conveyed to the Monroe County Rail Authority and Lackawanna County Rail Authorities um, over the years. And again, uh, there were no shippers. The shippers were gone. There was nothing there. There were literally trees and bushes growing up between the ties, especially up in the, the Mount Pocono to Antelomic section of the line. Um, so um, it, was, uh, it, was, uh, it, was, it was a high pressure, high stakes game, but uh, uh, the, the right parties came to the table uh, at the right time. And I have to give credit to Jim Hagan for, uh, for uh, the decision to uh, convey it to us, because otherwise it, uh, it would be gone. Now what year is that approximately? Um, that year, I'm trying to remember exactly, I'm probably going to get it wrong. Uh, it was, uh, I'm going to say mid-80s, mid uh, I don't remember the exact year, but uh, okay. everything was gone, the shippers were gone, like I said, it was legally, portions of it were legally abandoned. And uh, uh, it was in the liquidation phase, so it was, it was fairly critical. Because one of the things that which be becomes apparent now, because uh, um, to just give a little bit of background, which I would have covered at the very end of my uh, previous episode 13, here in episode 14, where in 1979 the uh, the the last of the freight, actually it's the end of 78, that the last of the freight is carried over the line. There's actually some that are, is carried locally in Pennsylvania, but the cutoff is, is um, put out of service at the beginning of 1979. Passenger service has been gone since 1970, as you, as you point out. So at that point, what happens is that, which is never happened before was that Pennsylvania I think has to think of itself as being separate from the rail line in New Jersey because in a, before you would, it would never been something you would think about oh it's one main line but now it's really in that sense two separate lines even though they, they at least at, up until 1984 were still connected and they have in a sense separate interests or let's say separate uh, almost Political mechanisms that would be needed to be enacted in order to, to preserve them, because you know, as they say, well, politics is local. Um, 
New Jersey would have to do their part for the, the cutoff, and Pennsylvania would have to do its part for the line of Pennsylvania. So, it, to me, I, uh, you know, there's been an observation, and which we'll get into in future episodes, about the uh, the focus on Pennsylvania. But, but clearly, you folks have really uh, done a yeoman's job in trying to not only preserve the line, but also build the line up. You know, build freight business that didn't previously exist, um, which is, you know, that's quite a, an undertaking to say the least, and to be successful on top of that as well is a, quite a, let's say, uh, should be, you should be highly complimented for that. Well, and, and let me just uh, answer, uh, give some background on both, uh, both sides of that. Number one, yes. Um, but the other thing we realized then, again, if we didn't, as the locals, at the grassroots, the counties, if the counties didn't do something, local government, if they didn't do something, uh, the lines would be liquidated. So that was the first major realization that had to be made. Um, but, you know, we weren't in a vacuum. We were talking with uh, our friends on a local level in Warren and Sussex counties, New Jersey. So it wasn't in a vacuum, and it wasn't like uh, Pennsylvania and New Jersey and never the twain shall meet, because that wasn't the case. Um, they were going through the same strife that we were. Uh, so we were sharing ideas, we were forming partnerships. And, and uh, again, I have to, uh, you know, uh, mention the people that we worked with for, for all, over all these years, people like Frank Riley and Tom Drabeck uh, and the others, and, and you, Chuck, and, and uh, the other organizations that were involved over there, um, you know, to keep the idea and the dream of putting it back together way, way back then when Conroe was actually pulling the rail up in New Jersey. Um, so it goes back a long, long way. Um, you know, as things then evolved, kind of flash forwarding a little bit, uh, maybe I'm jumping ahead here a little bit, but it ties in, uh, things weren't just static. Uh, unfortunately, they weren't able to save it in New Jersey. Um, there were no private interests, uh, there, there were no, you know, there were no uh, local rail authorities in place to do what we were able to do here in Pennsylvania. Um, but flash forward, uh, because of those local gra grassroots contacts in Warren and Sussex counties uh, and the political structure uh, involved therein, um, you know, we were and they were in, in partnership able to bring it to the point of even after Conrail ripped up the rail, sold the property to private interest, which is really the death knell almost in any case of bringing a rail line back. Get, uh, they were able to get to the hurdle back of using, get, having the state come in and condemn what Conrail actually sold, which was a cutoff. And I know f I'm flashing over an awful lot of years and an awful lot of strife that went into that. But uh, the miracle was that they were able, uh, in New Jersey, to come back to the point of actually condemning it and getting the title back. Because it could have easily been cut up, uh, sold off in pieces, uh, the fills could have been uh, taken away. Uh, there's so many things that could have happened um, to actually preclude any possible future uh, restoration of it. Um, so they had. To, so again, the local counties, Warren and Sussex, and everyone else involved, New Jersey Transit, uh, New Jersey DLT, uh, and, and 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 the political structure in New, New Jersey uh, had the fortitude to come back um, and, and do what, what is almost impossible. And that is. Um, condemn the, the right of way, get it back in their ownership, uh, and bring it to the point where at least, uh, you know, we're, we're back to the point of laying track. Yeah, and that, that essentially that's where um, this particular episode ends, but the thing is that um, you, you raise a, a very important point, and that is that in a sense that, uh, well, clearly in the first round, if you will, in, in terms of New Jersey and the cutoff, the, the effort to preserve the line failed. But ultimately, you have to think that, in, and, and that's the, what you were able to do here in, in Pennsylvania, is that, and, that ultimately the line would have had to end up in public hands anyway. Because we can, I think you could probably use examples uh, and elsewhere where rail service is being proposed, passenger service, commuter service, and where there's a, a a, a private railroad that owns the trackage, and it's thought, well, you know, gee, the tracks are there, and you can all you have to do is run trains. But it's um, in, in dealing with a private entity is a, a lot different than dealing with a public entity. 
And um, I'm wondering now that if, uh, at least the scenario that played out, that that was the scenario that had to play out sooner or later. It would have been nice if the tracks had never been taken up in New Jersey. I think we all agree that would have been so much more helpful and made the things a lot easier. In public ownership, rem removes certain impediments that would be there if it were not in public ownership. Right. And and this, again, might be jumping ahead, but, you know, the, the, the most asked question is, why is it taking so long? Uh, again, uh, that, that rail line, the, the cutoff in New Jersey, was uh, as close to dead as, as any rail line ever got. And, and in effect, it was dead, just about. Uh, it was resuscitated at the last moment um, through, all, through this condemnation. But when I say that, uh, that, that took years and years and years. Uh, like I said, once the railroad was sold, it was Conrail sold that, uh, the cutoff in New Jersey to private interests. Um, you know, it, it was years that was held by these private landowners, basically. Uh, and it took years for the condemnation, for New Jersey to make the uh, uh, decision to go through with the condemnation, to get the money, because you're talking, you're talking uh, you know, it costs $25 million to do this thing. Uh, as far as the condemnation, and then to go through the condemnation process, it took years and years and years and years. And I know, you know, it's it's not what people want to hear, but that's the history of it, and that's what happens when you let a, a rail line go to the point of the rail being lifted. This is what happens. Uh, it takes years to come back, um, and uh, I'm not trying to make excuses, but that's just the facts, and, and that's what happens uh, when a rail line is uh, not only abandoned but liquidated. Well, the thing is, with most rail lines, um, in a sense, you don't have this problem. In other words, when, uh, most rail lines, when they're abandoned, no one's really thinking about, well, we're, we're going to think about bringing this back right away. And actually, that thinking was already there before the rail was removed. So this was an effort that, in a sense, um, goes back to almost, in a sense, to the days that where the line was put out of service, where the threat was obvious at that point, and it played out over the next next five years after that in New Jersey. But it the, the effort never died. Right. It, it was kept alive, and that, uh, you, that's a very good point. It was kept alive, and again, it was kept alive, like I said before, uh, at the grassroots level, at the county's level. The counties knew that um, there was no one else there. There were no private interests. There was no other interests. There was nobody else around um, that wanted it. Uh, and uh, they had to make the uh, conscious decision to, to take the risk uh, of saving it uh, for future generations. And uh, uh, it was kept alive, the dream was kept alive. And as long as that dream is alive, uh, the entire thing will be put back. Here we are at the eastern end of the Delaware River Viaduct. We are actually in New Jersey at this point. And in fact, I am standing at almost the exact point at which Conrail on June 19th, 1984 started removing track from here east all the way to Port Mars which is approximately 27 miles from this location here and if we look around and face towards the water gap Slate for Junction is around the curve and about a mile and a half from here. So, as of June 19, 1984, the track started to disappear, if you will, eastward. The track stayed here in, on, on the viaduct and also in Pennsylvania for another few years, as a matter of fact. They were not taken up immediately. In fact, there, you, you would say, well, are there any tracks at all left on the cutoff? And in fact, there actually are. There's a small section that's underneath the Slateford Road Bridge and over by Slateford Junction. It's, those tracks are literally buried, maybe 100 feet or so of track, uh, sit under the fill of the uh, what was a bridge, which is now a, a fill-in. So in a segment where, we're, where I interviewed Larry Malski, we were talking about abandonment. And as you can see, the tracks are 
course long gone from this this bridge but in, in terms of the effort to acquire the land over the cutoff and to, to save the right-of-way in this particular segment we're talking about the period of time between 1979 and 1984 on October 5th of 1984 basically you could say what we're talking about in this episode ends because the track is gone in a sense the the cutoff has died you can say farewell at that point that the, the cutoff is is basically history now we know and we will talk about this in future episodes it's, it's far from history but at that point in time it was to say the very least a very bleak situation and very few people thought that they at some time in the future that we'd be even thinking about the possibility of returning the rails. Now, as we'll find out in our next episode, things will actually get worse after you think it was bad enough that in 1984 that the tracks have been removed from the cutoff and would be removed from this section as well later on, a few years later, that that was as bad as it could get. Well, in the next episode we'll talk about it actually um, we, we go from dark to even darker, if you will, in terms of the times that uh, the, the cutoff would have to experience. Now, uh, it, in uh, using Larry Malski's uh, terminology, hearkening back, one of the things that happens with the cutoff, and I'm going to walk over and once again face towards this is New Jersey. We're, we're actually in New Jersey. Route 80 is, is below us. Uh, the Delaware River on, uh, is the demarcation line between the states of Pennsylvania and New Jersey. So in, in terms of Larry Mouse's description of the abandonment process, the cutoff goes through abandonment, I would say abandonment in the sense that it, from the legal perspective, in, in 1982. And in 1984, the second stage occurs where the, the tracks are actually lifted. But if you go back to 1979, Amtrak runs its one and only train over the cutoff, in fact, over the entire uh, Scranton division, on November 13th, 1979. We'll show, you, we'll show you some photos from that particular run uh, along the cutoff and even into Pennsylvania. I actually saw that train pass my house in South Orange, as a, as a matter of fact. Um, and that particular run, even though it did not lead to Amtrak service, at least not yet, it didn't lead to it in those days, it did increase the visibility of the entire project early on. You could say it was, a, a, if you use the American football metaphor, that it was in a sense a Hail Mary pass, that, at, sort of like at the end of a game, where you hope that you can score with a very, very long pass uh, with probably very small chance of you actually winning, but you know, you, you, you give that chance. And in a sense, Am the Amtrak run, even though it was early on in the effort, it was really in a sense like a Hail Mary pass because I think everyone knew when that was, that particular run uh, was being proposed to Amtrak that the chances of Amtrak actually coming in and r running an operation was very slim. If you think about it, that at that point in time, Amtrak being a, a, a passenger railroad, there hadn't been a passenger train on this line in almost a full decade. In fact, it was only about two months short of a full decade since the last run of the Lake Cities, the Erie Lackawanna train, the Lake Cities in early January of, of 1970. So when the 
line is put out of service in 1979 with freight, there's, there's nothing here, nothing running on this, on this line. Amtrak would be the one exception. Uh, there actually was a, a plow, I wouldn't call it a train, but a, 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 an engine with a plow that was run in, in 1983. But except for the rail train itself that would come and remove the rail, there, there was nothing uh, that was actively taking place on this railroad during that period of time. So when the tracks are, are, are removed in 1984, understandably, many people thought, well, that's it. That's, that's, that's the end of the story. They're um, like the 999 out of a thousand other cases, this would be just another rail line that would go into abandonment and uh, would be just a footnote to history. Fortunately, that's not what has happened. Nevertheless, as Larry Malski points out, it, a line that goes through abandonment and then also, in addition, goes to the removal of the track has, well, you could say almost two feet in the grave. Now, fortunately, the state of New Jersey, which we'll talk about at the end of our next episode, will come in uh, and through a long process will actually acquire this land, uh, I'll say the right-of-way, but the, the cutoff, to preserve its potential for future use. And that was really the most important thing that could be done because the, the, the risk that Conrail posed was one thing, it could remove the track. We'll talk about in our next episode as to what f further risk or further peril, if you will, would be brought upon the, uh, the cutoff from, and I won't give it away at this point, but um, uh, from what private ownership would mean to the cutoff. So in any case, that's, that's where we stand, or where we stood, at the end of 1984. Conrail's ripped up the track, an empty right-of-way, uh, at least here in New Jersey. And at that point, they're starting to look for a seller. Uh, and it will, as it will turn out, as the, the seller will actually come to them, ironically. Um, and. I, I will begin our next episode, which will be episode 15, with that story, how that particular saga begins, which would be uh, basically a 16-year saga of the state of New Jersey trying to acquire the cutoff. But that's our next episode. So that's the end of this episode. Farewell to the cutoff. Not exactly, but keep in mind that that's, at that time, point in time, 1984, that's what most people were probably thinking. So I hope that you enjoyed episode 14, and that you'll look forward to episode 15 on the Lackawanna Cutoff.